Yesterday we began our studies together by asking ourselves the question as to whether or not Christ has first place in our lives. And I challenged each of us, including myself, to think about that throughout the week and look for opportunities of where we can better align our expressed intent and the behavior that we manifest on a daily basis. To think through our lives and to find areas of inconsistency, of where we say on the one hand, I want to seek first the kingdom. My intention is to seek first Christ above all else, but then on the other hand, we see an element of inconsistency. And you wonder, well, what drives that? What drives that inconsistency in our lives? Is it the tyranny of the urgent, of where we have present circumstances that creep up into our lives? Anxiety builds and mounts as we face those challenges that seem to be right in front of our face. And we end up putting on the back burner things that are important, the things of the truth that perhaps don't seem as urgent as the thing that's right in front of our face. Perhaps we have a life full of conflicting priorities, of where on the one hand we're trying to seek first the kingdom, but we have work, we have school, we have other recreational pursuits that we've brought into our lives that tend to push us into two different camps, of where we have one foot it would seem in the kingdom and the other foot in other things. Yet we know the counsel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can't serve two masters. So what is it then that drives this type of behavior? We can think about many different reasons. Because we've all committed to leave the old way of life behind. To put to death the old man. But it seems that vestiges of the old man remain. And continue to sap the nutrients from our lives like parasites that we should be using to produce fruit to our Heavenly Father. Well, I think that Paul through the Spirit could sense this challenge that the Colossian believers were facing. That as he listened to the report from Epaphras, he could hear and he could understand that they were struggling to not give way to these alternative doctrines, to not go down a pathway that would result in them losing the fruit that they were producing. And I believe that there was one central thing that was brought to him that he should communicate to the Colossians, and that was that they needed to gain an appreciation for the magnitude of what redemption looked like in Christ to really appreciate the magnitude of what the Lord Jesus Christ had done for them in offering the forgiveness of their sins and redeeming them, bringing them from a position of death to a position of life. And I would argue that if we don't really appreciate the value of the magnitude of what Christ has done for us, then we won't prioritize it at the proper level in our lives. We'll hedge our bets and we'll end up pursuing things in this life and the things of the kingdom. And so in this class together, what we're going to take a look at is how Paul tries to establish the magnitude of the things in Christ in Colossians chapter 1, to really put this before the Colossian believers such that they might put Christ in the proper priority to truly give him first place in their lives. There's a number of phrases that are used throughout Paul's writings that really help to illustrate this aspect of preeminence, to emphasize these key elements of the message. One of them is in Christ, or in Him, or for Him, or for whom. It occurs at least 31 times of where Paul is continually pre preaching the message that unless you are in Christ, unless you have committed your life to Him, you have not done anything as it pertains to salvation. You are outside the promise. That's the first step, is committing yourself to Christ to be in Him. One of the other things that Paul was struggling with, or the Colossians were struggling with, is the aspect of Gnosticism. This element that there's some worldly wisdom and understanding, a higher intellectual capacity that needed to be pursued in addition to the things of Christ. And we could see that creeping into our own community with some of the different science falsely so-called that seems to want to supplant the fundamental elements of the truth that we hold dear. And so what seeks to be done here in Paul's letter to the Colossians is he brings out these elements of learning and knowledge. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, teaching, mystery, truth, and learning with the references that are shown on the screen to illustrate to them not the things of this world, but these are all wisdom and understanding and learning associated with the things of Christ. There is nothing outside of Christ that you need to know in order to be saved. 
And all of those things pertaining to wisdom and understanding, all of those mysteries that you think are hidden, have now been revealed in Christ. And how comprehensive are those things? Is it just to the select few? Well, Paul says, no, it's complete. It's to every man, to all. Everyone is included. This is why Christ died, that anyone who believes should not perish, but should have eternal life. And so he brings out these phrases of all and every, complete and fulfilled, a number of times to bring together this united message that being a body in Christ, united in him based on a true knowledge, is the complete purpose of life. And we see this repetition that God uses consistently throughout Scripture to drive into our minds messages that are, innate, that are not innately understood by us, that are difficult to, for us to understand because we have the natural mind at work. And so we see this repetition come forward time and time again, establishing the foundational point that being in Christ is the way to salvation, that this is the only way forward. So don't turn to ritual, don't turn to law is what he's telling the Colossians. These elements of learning and knowledge that Jesus Christ is preeminent. No matter what else we hear in the world that sounds intriguing, of different evidence and things brought forward, that people say, look, this disproves what God has said. We know that discoveries continue to reveal, as we were reminded last night from our brother John's class, Discoveries continue to reveal that God is right as man unearths the evidence of what God has done throughout history. Paul says, don't be fooled by that. And third, this completeness, that there is one body, Jews and Gentiles united in Christ, and that the gospel call is to all, and that God expects unity of the body. And we'll see this throughout Paul's appeal to the Colossians as we read through it together. And as we enter into chapter 1, because remember yesterday's class was about painting the context, painting the picture, seeing the forest, and now we're going to enter in to look at the specific trees, as it were, to see what it is that God reveals through Paul as to what it is that we should be taking away. Colossians chapter 1, a suggested outline, is he talks about fruitfulness in verses 1 through 12. Christ the firstborn in verses 13 to 20, and the benefit and universal offer to all people. Remember, Paul had only met some of the believers in Colossae. He knew some of them by name, but there were a large number that he didn't know. And it seems that he had never really visited there or spent any appreciable amount of time. So we can see this reflected in the introduction as to how Paul appeals to them. In chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, He's saying, this is a letter from me, Paul, to you in Colossae. There's a personal aspect, a personal appeal that Paul is putting here. Yet there's the apostolic authority stamped on this, that Jesus Christ had selected him to be Christ among the Gentiles. Remember in Acts chapter 9 that Christ showed Paul how great things he must suffer for his name. And this is how Paul saw himself, as Christ to the Gentiles. And he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Saints was their position, that they had accepted the calling. They were now separate. They were now holy, set apart for God. That was their position before God. But Paul says that these are faithful brethren in Christ, that not only positionally were they correct, but behaviorally they were correct, which is what faithful speaks to, that they were living up to the commitment that they had made of being in Christ. And we're familiar with this phrase in Colossians 1 and verse 2, of brethren in Christ, because that's where our community derives its name from, of Christadelphians. And so what Paul is saying here is to the faithful Christadelphians in Colossae, just put yourself in their seats for a moment. Imagine that we show up to family camp this week, and we receive a letter from the Apostle Paul that says to the saints and faithful Christadelphians at family camp. And we say that's what we're going to study this week. We're going to study Paul's letter to the faithful Christadelphians at family camp. You think about how encouraging that would have been to these brothers and sisters in Colossae to receive this from the Apostle Paul, this genuine appeal to them. The Apostle Paul was well known in the region, as we saw yesterday, attributed miracles, signs, and wonders to Paul. Of course, it was God working through Paul, but to receive something from Paul, this personal appeal, from Paul to them, is difficult to express with words what that would have meant. 
But Paul continues on to give words of encouragement from the beginning, to help to strengthen them from the outset, that though there's difficult things to deal with, Paul is going to be encouraging. He says that he prays for them always in verse 3, that he heard of their faith and their love in verse 4. He reminds them of their hope in verse 5. Paul is encouraged that they're bearing fruit like other believers in verse 6. And he tells them, he communicates to them the good message that Epaphras had brought to them in verses 7 and 8. It's pretty amazing when you see the way that Paul is working through this as God reveals to him what it is that he should say to these brothers and sisters that he might encourage them in the faith. One of the opening lines that he says to the faithful Christadelphians in Colossae is grace and peace be unto you. And we wonder why that introduction. Sometimes we can read through the introductions and think, okay, yeah, yeah, let's get to the point. What's going on with the letter? But this can't be skipped and read over quickly because grace and peace is something that appears in almost every single New Testament book, every single New Testament epistle almost that's written in the New Testament. Why? What is the purpose of grace and peace? What's trying to be communicated to us here? It has to be significant. Well, when you think about grace, grace is the way that God treats us. It's his undeserved favor. And without God's undeserved favor, we could put all of our efforts in the world into it and it would amount to nothing without the grace of God being extended to us through the work of his son. And peace is the result that God has joined us to his family as believers to be one body, to be his family in Christ which brings us peace. So we have the enabler of God's grace, and the result, if we actually live it in our lives, is peace based on righteousness. And that comes up in almost every New Testament book in the Bible to help to remind us of what it is that we're working toward, starting with the end in mind. And Paul bookends grace at the beginning and at the end of the book of Colossians to help them realize that everything that they have, every effort, is dependent upon God's unmerited grace and favor that he shows to each and every one of us. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ seems to key on this as well. On the night that he was betrayed in John 16 and verse 33, when he's making the prayer for his disciples, and he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so as we go through tribulation in this life, the reminder is that it's working toward the end of peace. That no trial for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. But afterward, after it's complete, it works the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised thereby. This is the exhortation that Christ is giving. And Paul is simply re-echoing that exhortation as Christ to the Gentiles as he speaks to the brothers and sisters in Colossae. Well, keeping that line of thought in verse 3, Paul continues on to share his personal thankfulness for them, that he's giving thanks for them, to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, this wasn't a one-time prayer where he heard an announcement about a brother or sister that was struggling and needed help and said, right, i got to pray for them. Remember to pray for them that day, and then the events of the week took forward and he was just completely hijacked by the things that were in front of him. That happens to us pretty regularly, I would argue, that we're not intentional enough about praying for each other. And not just praying for each other in generics, but giving thanks. Paul says, I give thanks for you. How often? Always. And if we're going to give thanks for somebody, it means that we actually view them as a blessing. That we view our brothers and sisters as a blessing such that we would give thanks for them. But it wasn't just openness that he's giving thanks for. There's specificity here in what Paul's saying. What exactly is he giving thanks for? Well, he goes on to talk about the things that he had heard in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which he had to all the saints. This was Paul's account of what he had heard concerning their faith, concerning their love, and how they were manifesting that to the brothers and sisters. Faith in Christ Jesus, the love to all the saints, and the hope laid up for you in heaven. Faith, hope, and love being listed together here. Why these three? What is Paul trying to communicate through the Spirit to these brothers and sisters in Colossae? 
Well, faith forms the foundation, doesn't it? Because faith is inclusive of our beliefs. And whether or not we want to admit it, we act based on our beliefs. Our experiences form our beliefs, and our beliefs lead to actions, and those actions lead to results. And Paul knows that they needed to have the right foundation, and indeed they did. They had the right foundation. They had accepted the belief, and as a result, they put it into practice by showing love. Love is their motivation. It had to be the motivating force at the heart of everything that they did. And love is primarily shown in the way that we treat each other. And he reminds them of their hope. Why did they believe? Why did they make the effort to show it in their love to others? To have the right motivation because of what it was working toward. The hope that was laid up for you in heaven. So we have the foundation, the motivation, and the destination all revealed here as Paul speaks to the Colossians at the outset of this letter to encourage them in what they had accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you were to look at all three of these elements, you can see that faith is our connection to God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Because those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Love is our connection to other believers. In fact, we're going to find in a future class that in Colossians 3 and verse 16, love is described as the ligament of the body, the thing that holds the bones together, that takes individual members and constructs them into one functional whole. We can't say that we love God and hate our brother. Love is our connection to other believers. And hope is our confident expectation of being incorporated into God's glory, as we read in Colossians 1 and verse 27. We can see these three elements come up in various parts of Scripture. And one of them that draws these three together quite nicely is Galatians. In Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh, or is energized, by love. Faith being energized by love. Faith is meaningless if it's not motivated, if it's not energized by the right motivation, a loving spirit that's manifested in the way that we interact one with another. And Paul is starting out at the very beginning to say that he's extremely pleased with the report that he's received concerning their faith and their love as they work toward their hope together as a unified body in Christ. And as Paul presses forward, he draws an analogy to a parable of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not sure if you noticed it while we were reading through it yesterday in this section as we read for our opening reading yesterday, but there seems to be an analogy to the parable of the sower and some of the phraseology that's being used. You can see a connection here in Colossians 1 and verse 5 where they had heard the word of the truth, the gospel. In Matthew 13 and verse 19, they heareth the word of the kingdom. Even the same Greek is being used, of bearing fruit. I won't try to say that Greek word, but you can see it on the screen. Bringing forth fruit and being fruitful in verses 6 and 10. And the Lord Jesus Christ talks about bearing fruit. Matthew 13 and verse 23 and Mark 4 verse 20. The Greek word oxana, which means to increase. Being fruitful unto every good work and increasing, as we see here in verse 10. The Lord Jesus Christ talks about the good ground in Mark 4 and verse 8 yielding fruit and increasing. Same Greek being used. And they followed the same process that the Lord Jesus Christ had identified of hearing, of knowing or understanding, and bringing forth fruit. And so this analogy is being drawn between them and the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ to the Gentiles, sharing with them that they were actually fulfilling Scripture. You wonder, well, what's the so what? Why does it matter that there's an analogy between them and the good ground? It's because what's being done here is he's showing them that they're actually fulfilling Scripture. Because when you look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 21 and verse 43, when he's speaking concerning the state of Israel, he says that the truth or the gospel will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Paul says, you're that nation. You're part of that nation that's bringing forth fruits. You're actually fulfilling the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. How encouraging would that have been to the Colossians as they listened to this letter being read to them that they themselves were fulfilling 
the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ in bringing forth fruit. But there was a danger. And the danger is that they wouldn't quite hold on to the truth. And instead of holding on to the truth, they would become uprooted from Christ, as we're going to see in tomorrow's class, in Colossians 2 and verse 7. That the fruit that they had produced would be stolen away, that they would lose their reward, Colossians 2 and verse 8, and in verse 18. And that they would almost go from, the, from the, the good ground to the stony ground, not having a root in themselves and instead drying up and not bearing fruit or enduring to the end. And so this is being positioned as a lesson that they could connect with. Because as we cast our minds back to yesterday's class, if we can remember back that far, one of the things that was known for in the region was not only the wool trade, but also the wines of Phrygia, the growing of fruits. And so this aspect of fruitfulness was something that the people, the Colossians, those living in that Lycus River Valley, could connect to. And so you can see a strategy here in what's being used in the way that God is communicating through Paul in connecting with those to whom he is speaking, finding things that would relate to them. This was something that Paul did deliberately every time that he preached. In 1 Corinthians 9, we can read about Paul's efforts in regards to him being explicit to the Corinthians, that he becomes all things to all men. Paul was a connector, and he looked for opportunities to find things that were relevant to those who he was talking to, to be able to help them affinitize new information and connect it to something that they already knew. And if he could do that by telling a story, just like the Lord Jesus Christ did, then he could align with what Christ did and be able to help others learn the truth. So think about that as it pertains to us in our preaching to others. Do we take the time and make the effort to connect with those to whom we are preaching? Or is it simply just sharing all the things that maybe we don't believe? I don't believe this, I don't believe that. Do we look for the positives? Do we see what's relevant to the people that we're speaking to? Because Paul did this. He never compromised the truth. He always maintained the integrity of the truth. But when he did it, he did it in a way that was relevant to those whom he was speaking. And there's a great lesson for us in this. Why would he do this? Why would we make the effort to connect? Is it simply so that other people will do what we want, so that selfishly we can get what we want? Well, Paul reveals to us why it is that he went to this effort. He says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22, that I am made all things to all men, that I might by some means, or by any means, save some. Paul's motivation was to save others. That's why he made the effort to understand, to connect, to relate to other people, such that they could relate to the message of Christ. It's as the old adage go that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the reality of that can really be seen and felt as we talk to other people and as the Colossians received this message. But how do we get ourselves to care? Well, Paul reveals a secret to that in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19 of where he says that he had made himself a servant to all men. We need to view ourselves as servants of each other. Because if you think of a servant, how would a servant successfully serve their master? The only way that they can do this effectively is if they know who they're serving. And by knowing each other, making the effort to know what each other are going through, the struggles that we're facing, we'll be able to do exactly that, to serve each other and to help each other toward the kingdom. And so having made this connection between the Colossians and the good ground, Paul goes on to explain the other things that he was praying for on their behalf. Over and over and over again, you can see in the top left, Paul was continually praying, making appeals to God on their behalf. These were Paul's prayers that he was offering, that he wanted them to understand. Giving thanks in verse 3, praying always in verse 3, not ceasing to pray in verse 9, desiring in verse 9, giving thanks in verse 12, over and over and over again, this emphasis that he wanted the best for them. He wanted them to be in the kingdom, and his prayer life was evidence of that. 
But what exactly was Paul praying for? He's just drawn this analogy between them and the good ground. And now he's going to talk about growth and the inputs and the outputs that are needed from them to be able to truly grow in the way that God has described. And you can see this unpackaged for us as we go through Colossians chapter 1. In verse 10 he talks about, or verse 9 rather, the inputs, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will, with his wisdom, with his spiritual understanding. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, all things that they would attribute to something besides Christ. He says, no, no. True wisdom, true knowledge, true understanding, it's all in Christ. And I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Because if you're filled with God, then you have no room for anything else. And so he says that's the input that you need, is to be filled with the knowledge and wisdom and understanding of God. And the desired output that he's been praying for in verse 10 is that they would walk worthy, that they would be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And so Paul is here connecting the abstract to the tangible to say that if you want to have the right outputs, then you need to have the right inputs. And as we think about our own lives, what do the inputs to our lives look like? And are those inputs supportive of our expressed intent of what we're trying to achieve. Think about the things that we consume on a daily basis, not physically consume, but mentally. The things that we entertain ourselves with, the things that we spend our time doing. Where is our focus? Where is our effort? Where is our energy? When we have time available, what do we spend it on? Do we spend it on the things that pertain to the kingdom or not? Because if we're not putting the right inputs in, we are not going to get the right outputs out. And it's just like Paul says in Galatians, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're involved in the right things, if we're filling ourselves with God, then we won't have room for anything else. Unless the Colossians think that it's this simple equation, this machine of where they put something in and then out pops this great result, we know that's not how it works. He adds in that you need a key enabler to make that happen. And the key enabler is in verse 11 that you might be strengthened with God's power and God's might, creating an endurance and a joyful patience. And I'm sure that we can relate to this, knowing that we need an enabler to be able to get the desired output, that just the right inputs alone, that's necessary, but more is needed if we're truly going to be able to achieve the right outputs. We need the strength of God to be able to accomplish this. That word for might that occurs, strengthened with all might, is from dynamo which means power. It's the same root word that Paul uses in Philippians 4 and verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that the power comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he has accomplished. Our Lord, therefore, empowers us to accomplish what we ourselves cannot, is a key enabler that Paul is saying here in verse 11. And this empowerment is primarily seen in what it creates within us, an endurance patience. And we know that endurance comes as a result of trial. You take a look at Romans 5 and verse 3, that tribulations work patience. That word for patience in Romans 5 and verse 3 is actually that word endurance. It's just like exercise, physical exercise. You know, if we were to do the same amount of physical exercise that we do every day here at family camp out in the field, we'd probably be in great shape. But the reality is that we don't do that, so if we try to do a lot of physical exercise, we find that we're extremely sore after a couple days. But if we were able to maintain that level of physical exercise, our endurance would increase. And we'd become stronger and stronger and be able to endure longer and longer. We're talking about the same thing here from a spiritual perspective. That we're exercised by the trials that we endure. It's the same concept that Paul speaks about in Hebrews chapter 12. That it's necessary to go through tribulations such that we might gain that endurance and we might be strengthened by the strength which is afforded through God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we need to make sure that we have patience and joy, which are listed in Galatians 5 and verse 22 as part of the fruit of the Spirit. And so when we think about all of those things, what's trying to be identified here is the personal growth cycle that's required if we're going to bear fruit to our Heavenly Father. And as we think about the fact that God is enabling us to be able to accomplish what we ourselves cannot, 
that should create within us a sense of gratitude. And so having the right attitude, an attitude of gratitude, is one that's vitally important if we're going to succeed. And so in verse 12, this aspect of gratitude comes out, of giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And so this realization is meant to drive within us an attitude of appreciation of where we do the things of God, not because we're constrained to have to do it, but because we want to do it to show our thankfulness for all that God has done for us. And they needed to grasp this magnitude of what was truly done for them. And so what's going to happen now is Paul, as it were, is going to zoom in on verse 11 to talk about this key enabler and to show them that this enabler is actually Christ. And that they needed to appreciate that without this fundamental step in the process, that all of their efforts would be meaningless. And that therefore they needed to place Christ as preeminent, as first place above everything else in their lives. And the transition occurs in verse 13, of where he says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. When you read here, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that word power is different than what we read in verse 11, strengthened with all might. It's not the word dynamo. It's not the inherent source of power. Rather, in verse 13, it's exousia, which is granted authority. Darkness has no implicit power. There's no inherent power associated with darkness. Only the authority that we grant to it by not removing it from our lives. And what's being told to us here is that the authority of darkness has been removed from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he has translated us from darkness into the kingdom. We have been translated into the kingdom of his dear Son, of God's only begotten Son. Now this isn't saying, well, once you get baptized, then you're going to be, you know, be on the pathway to the kingdom. What's being communicated to us here is that you are actually in the kingdom, in God's mind. God calls those things which be not as though they were because our names are written in the book of life. And though the realization of that has not physically happened yet, in God's mind it's a reality because he sees us there. And it's our decision as to whether or not we're going to endure to the end and as we're told in Revelation 3, if our names are going to remain written in the book of life. We have been translated from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, present tense. Pretty amazing when you think about what God has accomplished through his son and what's been offered to us. And the Colossians would understand this from the perspective of what their ancestors had gone through. Remember Antiochus the Great around BC 200 had taken 2,000 Jewish families and had translated them from one region to the region of Phrygia. That Greek word methestemi carries with it the same meaning of translating from one location to another. And just as their ancestry had gone through this physically, this connection is being drawn that spiritually, this is what they had gone through by entering into Christ. It's amazing to understand some of the background to see how through the Spirit, Paul is able to leverage that same background to strengthen those believers and to greater connect with this message of what God had done for them through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's going to happen now is he's really going to augur in here on the Lord Jesus Christ to emphasize the superiority of Christ. And this occurs in verses 15 to 20. Eight times, two different phrases are repeated. That Christ is the pathway, and that phrase is in whom, by whom, and for him. Eight different times it's worth coloring in as a part of that greater subset that we were looking at at the beginning to see how this is being emphasized over and over and over again that Christ is the pathway. And the second aspect is that Christ has preeminence. Not only is he the pathway, but he is above all. He is above every creature. That everything was done through him. And that also occurs eight times in verses 15 to 20. And when you read verse 14, you can see that in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And I want to pause and think about that aspect of redemption and what it means in Scripture. Because redemption is to let one go free on paying a price. And there's two different ways in which somebody can be redeemed. 
You can pay the current master, and then you can take their servant. The second way is you can defeat that current master and destroy him and take all of his belongings. The second pathway is the one that Christ has followed in spoiling the strong man, in defeating sin, in securing those who are under that authority, and severing the contract that we have with death through our sins. This is the pathway that was followed with Egypt. Pharaoh didn't receive a payment for the slaves of Egypt. God simply destroyed Pharaoh and took his people back to him, reconciling them and redeeming them for himself. The historical context here, once again, is that slavery and redemption were well known in the Roman world. This was a concept that could easily be related to because of their current walk in life. And we receive the forgiveness of sins. As I've already mentioned, severing the contract between sin and death and translating us from a status of death to life. Sometimes we can read through that intellectually. We can say, yeah, I get it. But do we really get it? Do we really stop and think about the price that was paid that we might have the opportunity to be delivered from our current state, to be delivered from a state of sin and death, to serve God forever in the kingdom? It's worth meditating on that and thinking about it because I know that I'm guilty of just reading it and moving on and saying, yeah, I get it, but do we really get it in the way that we live our lives? Is that really reflected in our focus and the way that we conduct ourselves one with the other? That's a challenge to think about in terms of our grasp of the magnitude for what God has accomplished through his son and what it means practically in our lives. And so what happens now is he talks about a new creation that's been established in Christ. This new creation. And so as we read in verse 15, he says, speaking of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And that word image is the word icon. And in the Septuagint, it's the same word that's used back in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And God created man in his own image and likeness. And sometimes we think that this image is just a physical likeness. But I believe that there's a moral similitude as well that's being talked about here. Of a moral similitude of the way that the character actually looks and what's being developed. Because in Genesis 5, after Adam and Eve's sin, Adam had a son in his likeness after his image. And it was only through conscious decision at the end of Genesis 4 that men began to call themselves by the name of the Lord in Genesis 4 and verse 26. And so what we're being told here is that the Lord Jesus Christ was the first individual to fulfill the design intent of the Father, to actually live up to the expectation of how God had designed man from the beginning and what he had intended for him. And as a result, he was the image of the invisible God. God had put his stamp upon him, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1. And as a result, he has become the firstborn of every creature, the first fruits of those who slept, and a first among a generation of firstborns, as we read in Hebrews. And so as we think about what is being unpacked here for us in verses 15 to 20, it's helpful to just go through the who, what, when, where, why, how of this to understand what's being spoken of. The scope here is all things that are in heaven and on earth. In heaven and on earth, not the physical heavens and the physical earth in the sense of creating those things. That already happened back in Genesis. What's being spoken of here is something new in the heaven, in the earth. Those things that exist. And it's going to be a new creation in Christ, as we're told. And who is involved is those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have committed their lives to him. But when did this new creation take place? Well, we're told that it was at his death and at his resurrection. Colossians 1 and verse 20. We're told that having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. That's when the reconciliation occurred, through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the time of his resurrection, that he might become the first fruits of those who slept. How did this occur? It occurred through his life. Because we're told in Romans 5 and verse 10 that we are saved by his life. At his death, as we just looked at in Romans 1, or sorry, Colossians 1 and verse 20. 
and at his resurrection, as we're told here in Colossians 1 and verse 18, that he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, which gets into the why. Why did God accomplish this? That in all things, in all things, he might have the preeminence, such that it might be to the praise of God's glory. This is why God created a new creation in his son, to have dominion over the authorities, the principalities and the powers, the things that previously, prior to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, had dominion over mankind, securing, having a contract between sin and death, that the Lord Jesus Christ was able to sever that, to have dominion over all of it, because he defeated it in himself, is what we're told in Colossians chapter 2. Obviously through the strength of his father, but nonetheless, a new creation is being formed. And Paul says you want to be a part of that new creation, leaving the old things behind and becoming a new creature that's reflected in new behavior, that's different from the things before. And his whole point is that Christ has to take first place in our lives, that Christ might have the preeminence in all things because they weren't elevating Christ to first place. And that's why the challenge to us is are we truly putting Christ as first place in our lives? Can we see that reflected in our behaviors? And you'll hear me repeat that over and over again because it's repeated over and over again in the book of Colossians because it takes a long time for us to get it. It's not natural for us to get it. We're not naturally wired to understand spiritual things. God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And it takes a lifetime for that to occur. And what Paul does here, through the Spirit, is he talks at the 30,000 foot view. He talks about all the things that God had done in making a new creation in all things that were in the earth, forming a new creation through his Son. But now he makes it intensely personal. He makes it intensely personal in verse 21, and he says, and you, and you, Colossians, and you at family camp, you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. It's not just about a macroscopic new creation at a huge level. It's now distilled down centrally to the personal impact on you and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, that you were once alienated, but now you have been reconciled. Our initial state was alienation and enemies by wicked works. And when you combine the messaging between Colossians and Ephesians, because these letters were written to the same area. And Paul expounds on this more in Ephesians. You can see that there's three main causes for being alienated from God that are identified in Scripture. Of wicked works in Colossians 1 and verse 21. Of genuine ignorance of the promises in Ephesians 2 and verse 12. And of willful ignorance. And what's being spoken to us here is that we've been taken from that state and we've been reconciled to be wholly unblameable and unreprovable, to be brought back into a state of harmony. And the scriptural process is outlined here, that Christ's sacrifice provides forgiveness, that we need to enter in Christ through knowledge and baptism, and requires faithful, continued obedience, as he says in Colossians 1 and verse 23. If you continue in the faith, Colossians are off to a good start. They're bearing fruit to their heavenly Father, but you need to continue in the faith. Keep pressing forward is what they're being encouraged to do here, to put off the old man and to put on the new man. And what's really amazing is to think about what this term reconcile actually means because it comes from a root word that actually means to exchange his coins for others of equivalent value. And so you can see some of the Roman coins on the screen here. And you're taking a coin of one value and exchanging it at equivalency for a coin of another value. And so what God does is he takes us in our current state, or our initial state rather, of being alienated from him through our wicked works, through our sins, and he counts us as equal value to holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, counting us as righteous through the work of his son. It's amazing when you think about it that God can take us, and each of us knows what us struggles with, and he can take us 
and move us and value us as righteous through what his son has accomplished if we continue pressing forward in the faith that God gives us an equivalent value of righteousness, taking us from darkness to life. It's amazing when you think about what God has truly accomplished for us. And Paul continues to make it intensely personal by saying that you need to continue in the faith in verse 23, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Jesus in Mark 16 and verse 15 said to preach the gospel to every creature. And once again, it's being quoted here to say, you are part of the fulfilling of Christ's message, of Christ's commission. Your belief, Colossians, is part of the fulfilling of God's message, but you need to continue in the faith. And this word grounded is actually a word that Christ uses in one of his well-known parables of building on solid ground versus building on sand. And one of the big lessons that comes out for us is one that, quite honestly, I've missed for a long time. The differentiating feature between the rock and the sand is not those who come to meeting versus those who don't. It's not those who do the Bible readings versus those who don't. The differentiating feature is what's shown on the screen. Because the rock come to Christ, they hear his words, and they do them, is what we're told in Luke 6 and verse 47. But those who build their house on the sand come to Christ, hear his words, and don't do them. Which means that those who build their house on the rock and on the sand are taking in the same inputs. But they're not showing the diligence and making sure that it's reflected in the output. They're hearing the word of God. They're reading the Bible. But it's not reflected in their behaviors. What about us? When other people look at our lives, just as a casual onlooker, third-person perspective, would they say that Christ is the first priority in our life? Just with no other information, just by observing. And if not, why not? What are those elements of inconsistency of where we're building our house on the sand? Because you think about the historical concept here, or the historical context, is that this region was prone to earthquakes. A.D. 17, remember from our background, of where this whole region was destroyed. Right around the time that Paul wrote this letter, the whole region was destroyed again by a monumental earthquake. And Paul is telling them the need to be grounded and settled on a firm foundation to build their house on a rock that would not be shaken. And we're told by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 that they needed to be rooted and grounded. Same word, grounded in love. That needs to be the motivation for what we do, to be grounded in love. And the way that we show it is how we behave one toward another. This word settled is steadfast and immovable. These elements of constancy and consistency. It's great that we come here and have a week around God's word, but we can't have it as just a blip in the sky that goes off like a firework and the rest of our lives is just filled with the mundane. We need to be consistent. We need to be constant. We need to be settled, as Paul's instructing us here, to continue on in the faith, to make sure that it's reflected in our actions and in our behaviors. And so as we continue pressing forward, we're reminded of the fact that right actions and the right attitude are required in response from us. But what are those things that can prevent us from continuing in the faith? How might we summarize some of those things? Well, if we're not bringing the right inputs in anymore. Clearly that's something that could happen to us. If we're no longer hearing or believing, not applying ourselves to study, attendance, or Bible readings, we just become too busy. We have a deliverable at work or school or some other event in life that we'll get to the readings later. We'll spend a little bit of time meditating later. Our prayer life, we'll get working on that in a little while. Just, I got to get through this, and then, then I'll get more serious about the things that matter. And we put off the things that we should be doing today until tomorrow or some future day, substituting other inputs, other things like entertainment and media for things that are really important. We may be hearing and believing the word, but we might no longer be doing it. It might be an intellectual exercise of where intellectually we see the foundation, but in actuality we're not doing it. And we become kind of the professor versus the practitioner. 
and we're warned against that, to actually do it in our lives. Now we may go the next step, and we may be hearing and believing and doing, but we're doing it with the wrong motivation. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that if we don't do it with the right motivation, if we don't have love, then it's meaningless. It's like a tinkling symbol. It's like noise with no substance behind it. And then we can be inconsistent in our worship. To where we offer distracted worship. We go through fits and spurts of being successful and putting first things first, but then falling out of the way and not being consistent in the way that we approach our worship toward our Heavenly Father. And so we need to consistently hear and do from the heart if we're going to continue in the faith is part of the messaging that's being shared with us here. So as we reflect on ourselves and as we think about some of the lessons that come forward, what are some of the things that we can take away from this? Well, part of the strategy that's put forward as putting Christ as first place is depicted here on the screen. To first recognize that Christ needs to be superior above all else. Because by putting Christ as superior to everything else in life, it gives us the proper perspective. We don't want to be seeing men as trees walking. We want to be seeing things in their proper perspective, having clarity of vision, such that Christ is truly at the forefront of our minds. The kingdom is right central in our focus, and not the trials and difficulties that are before us. Yes, we need to work through those things, but in their proper perspective is what's being put forward first. The second is to grasp the significance of the price that was paid. Because if we grasp the significance of the price that was paid, then it helps to establish value. If you give somebody something for free, they tend to not value it as much as if they actually have to pay for it. Because once you pay for something, then you've invested. And once you've invested, then you value it. And once we value and appreciate what has been invested on our behalf, what has been paid such that we might have the opportunity, then it will help us to value it ourselves as we press forward toward the kingdom. And we need to appreciate the magnitude, not just in the generic or abstract sense, but in the specific sense of what has been done for us. And you can see the pronoun shift here. To you, to you, to ye, to you. Every man, the focus is on what's been done for you. Let's talk about you and what this means to you personally. That this is what God has done for you. That you were alienated, but you have been reconciled. He wants to present you unblameable, unreprovable, unreproachable, holy. If you continue in the faith, for you, Paul was ministering. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And this was available to every man. That every man might be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. And if we can appreciate what's been done for us, then it creates a thankfulness to where we want to reflect that in our lives. When we lose perspective, the things in our present life appear as mountains that are immovable, that we just can't overcome. When we undervalue God's promises, the struggle just doesn't seem worth it, and we ease our shoulder from the plow. And when we lose appreciation, we no longer feel driven to show God our thankfulness by serving him in the way that he desires. And so to put Christ as first place, we need to make sure that we have the proper perspective, the correct value, and true thankfulness in our hearts as we press toward the kingdom together. So in summary then from this class, some of the exhortational points that come forward is that Christ truly does have to be first place in our lives above all things that we need to seek to bear fruit to God, to be the good ground in all things, that continual prayer for others is a hallmark of a true disciple, giving thanks for our brothers and sisters, identifying the positive elements and communicating them, to remember that in God's eyes, we are already in the kingdom, translated from darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. But to appreciate that, to truly enjoy it and be a part of it, we have to be committed to being in Christ to enjoy those benefits. And we have to, once we've made that commitment, continue in the faith by hearing and doing with the right attitude and being consistent in our lives. And the right prioritization is necessary through perspective, through value, and through appreciation. And so what we hope to do then in our next class is that having established the magnitude 
to press forward and to begin to take a look at what the threats are to true discipleship. That yes, they were currently redeemed and rooted in Christ, but what were the threats that would remove them away 